Let me make a few remarks prefatory to our first session. Let me say first that the world of expat management has changed drastically. Uh, as a sort of historian of international business, I note that at the end of World War II, uh, Americans were really expat managers all over the world, and it lasted about 20 years. And something happened, and uh, there were not as many of them. They were, of course, Europe directives. After that phase, we find a lot of Dutch, uh, Scandinavian, and of course the usual British, taking on functions of international management at the sea level. But something happened uh, um, that sort of shifted towards a search for talent, not so much for expat managers, but really a search for talent. And the issue became one of enticing the best and the brightest uh, to really move into your precinct, your national precinct. Uh, in the case of India in particular, I'd like to remark, uh, based on latest figures, and think, I think uh, Devesh will be able to correlate and confirm, perhaps, um, it is not worthy that of 1,000 people with the highest entrance scores uh, exams for India's elites, we're talking largely about IITs and IIMs, and we have a lot of them at Georgia Tech, both in the professorial core and among our students. We have over 1,200 Indian students pursuing graduate degrees. Of, of those 1,000 people with the highest scores in the entrance exams for India's elite, 36% today uh, migrate after graduation. Destination not specified, but largely the United States. And furthermore, and I think uh, our panel can comment on that, among the top 100 graduates uh, gathered together of all these institutions, IITs and IIMs, 62% migrate of the top 100. Uh, few governments think systematically, which Jack pointed out, about hiring talent as a corporate recruiter were, would. I'm reminded of an immigration officer going through a uh, an application file for an H-1B, 900 pages in length, and not understanding a thing of it, and having to turn it down so that it's, again, reapplied in the same language and overruled at an appeal level. Lengths of the process to admit the person, at least in this case in the United States, two years. Uh, now, in the case of the U.S., uh, with migration of Indian-based talents, one must remember, and I was a young kid in school, the landmark legislation of 1965, immigration reform, signed at the feet of the Statue of Liberty, which had the effect of removing the European preference, aka otherwise known as the national origin quota. Once that was done, the, the U.S., open it, its gates, as it were, to talent from all over the world. So it's a landmark legislation, 1965, and statistically you can trace the arrival of Indians but others in the United States at that particular point. Now let me say the issue has been well uh, addressed. I note in particular a colleague at Harvard University, William Kerr, who has uh, put together a book called The Gift of Global Talent, in which it decries uh, the complicated administrative mess that the U.S. has created to filter and admit the best talent. Um, and so Kerr note that the influx of global talent has transformed U.S. innovation with benefits flowing not only to, to immigrants themselves, but to natives. Today, we focus on global talent in the production of global leader, who may also have IT-related and technical talent. So having, uh, without further ado, I'm going to put on my hat as a moderator, and I think we are on time, and introduce our first panel. And it's my privilege to introduce a colleague. I'd heard a lot about him, Devesh Kapoor, who currently is the uh, Star Foundation South Asia Studies uh, professor at SIS, Johns Hopkins. And I, he indicated to me that uh, the old SIS moved a while back on, and, and into another part of Washington, closer to uh, the National Museum of Art. I did not know that. Um, um, so uh, Devesh, uh, Devesh's work on international migration 
examines the effect at a global level, not only on the part of the sending country, but also the receiving country. Uh, his book that stands out is Best and Brightest, The Global Hunt for Talent and Its Impact on Developing Countries. Several other books worth noting for us interested in India, India Study, South Asia Study, uh, one called The Other 1%, Indians in America, uh, a recent book on regulation in India. Uh, Devesh is a chemical engineer and has a PhD in public policy from Princeton. It's a pleasure to uh, introduce you and have you be the first presenter. And then I will subsequently introduce our two other speakers in turn. Thank you, Devesh. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Professor McIntyre and Mr. Hagni Othri, like for inviting me. Uh, so, uh, so one of the, I mean, the the focus of this panel is on the rise of Indian sea levels in, in global operations. So if we just look at, uh, sorry. So the case uh, right now, this is like from some uh, sort of recent study, uh, about 3.2% of the Fortune 500 CEOs are of Indian origin. Uh, which is more than twice the share of the U.S. population. And another 115 are in C-suites, you know, the chief, especially in positions of the chief information officer uh, or chief technical officer or chief finance officer. Uh, you also see a huge overrepresentation in these in founding sort, sort of unicorns uh, where the share is about 11 percent. Now, interestingly enough, we see something similar in the C-suite of politics. Uh, uh, people of Indian origin have been heads of state or at the highest levels of government in a host of countries in Southeast Asia, the Caribbean, and increasingly in Western countries, whether Ireland or Portugal. Uh, and of course, the, the 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 United Kingdom, where the last prime minister was of Indian origin. Uh, in the U.S., uh, as we are well aware, uh, after November, either the uh, first lady uh, or the second lady will be of Indian origin. And you've had some other Indian origin candidates who've been uh, quite viable and are likely to be around in future American politics as well. So, to the, so my presentation will be to try and understand sort of what explains this 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 phenomenon, right? So one, of course, is look the size of the underlying pool. Uh, India is the world's largest most populated country. And of course, if you, the larger the pool uh, and you're sampling for from a very, very large pool, you, you're likely to draw if you're sampling at the tail end of any distribution, it, it's going to be pretty good. It's not just that India is the largest, uh, most populated country. It's also ha has the largest number of international migrants. Third, it also has the largest number of highly educated international migrants. And in the US today, it's the second largest pool of migrants by country of origin after Mexico, and the third largest by ethnicity after Hispanics and Chinese. So if you look at the top five countries for international migration in 2020, uh, India was by far the largest, followed by Mexico, but Mexico is largely to the US. And I think the updated figures will show that international migrants from India today is about twice that from China. Uh, and these are countries with roughly comparable populations. Uh, if you look at highly educated migrants, uh, till the uh, till around 2000, actually, it was the UK, which was the country with the most international migrants. By highly educated, uh, we mean here people with at least a graduate degree or above. But what you see is that, that since the 2000, there's been a massive increase of 
highly educated international migrants from India. Uh, uh, Indian migration, especially of the highly educated, is unusually concentrated uh, in the Anglo-Saxon countries. Uh, in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, UK, and the US, Indians are either the largest or the second largest group of migrants. The in New Zealand figures are slightly dated, but all indications are by the next census, India will rank like number two. And so there is a, something to think about as to, it's not just about the concentration of the large pool of migrants, highly educated that are coming, but they're also headed in certain select countries. What we have begun to see since 2020, uh, or last five, seven years, is there is a growing increase to Western Europe, but that's still a relatively uh, sort of recent phenomenon. In the US itself, uh, what you see is a huge increase in the last 20 years. Two thirds of all international migrants from India in the United States have come after 2000. So it's a very young uh, migrant population, young by that I mean of relatively recent vintage. Uh, if we see in the last 12 years, what you see is actually the number of foreign born from Mexico in the US has actually declined. And what you see is that the largest increase is from India, followed by China. Uh, if you see this, if you move from migration to uh, uh, naturalization, once again, Indians are the second largest after Mexico. And if you see it over the last, uh, uh, since 2010, uh, what you see is that while migration from China has been increasing, but naturalization rates from China have not been increasing. In fact, they've been slightly falling and we, we don't really know why, whereas those from India have been actually increasing. Now, if you compare the Indian American population with the, with the native born as well as with the other foreign born, if you look at the US average, uh, what you see is that uh, that Indian Americans are much more educated and their incomes are about twice the American average. And I'll show you more about this uh, a bit later. So, so this is a sort of graph which really encapsulates the outlier status of Indian Americans in the US. So this is a graph which shows you on the y-axis median household income and on the x-axis the share with a graduate or professional degree. We know that by and large to get to the C-suite you you have to have you have to have sort of higher education you have to have a professional degree or a graduate degree and what you see is that on bo both counts how much of an outlier uh, sort of India is. The size of the bubble is represents the relative size of the population. Uh, so this is all the different immigrant groups. By that I mean that's based on their place of birth. Uh, we don't know at what age they came. Uh, and, and I think to me, this graph is sort of the most basic insight as to why you might expect a higher fraction of in, of Indians in higher management uh, uh, roles. Now, in contrast, if you look at India itself and compare it to other countries around the world, it's the opposite, right? It's at the lower, it's at the lower end of countries. Uh, uh, we know India is a is a low middle income country. So it's not surprising that both on income levels and people with higher education, uh, uh, relative to other countries around the world, India is much, much lower. And I want to alert you to this because this raises the question of some of the things about the role of culture. Because if culture were the primary determinant why would India not be doing much, much better? And the question is, is it the culture of the country of origin 
or the culture of the country of destination that makes a much bigger difference. So what I've argued, and in the book, the other 1% I co-author show that Indian migration to the US is one of the most selective migration in post-war history. Uh, it's extremely selective. Uh, there was a social selection in India. Almost all of, of uh, a very large fraction is upper caste. Second is the exam-based selection with Dr. McIntyre referred to, which is the IITs, uh, the engineering colleges, highly competitive exams. And the third is the entry, which is the selection into the U.S., where you largely come through higher education or H-1B visas, et cetera. And that's a pretty selective process by itself. And which, again, uh, favors those with STEM backgrounds. So you can see here, uh, this is as far back as we can get data on international students in the US. Uh, what you see is that till the 80s, uh, you had uh, considerable numbers coming, but it's a sea change in the past 20 years. And that's true of both China as well as students from India. But in the last few years, we see we begin to see a decline from China and a continued acceleration from India, right? And in the last 20 years, it's increased almost by a factor of seven. Uh, and that's a huge increase. Uh, uh, and what this means like for the future, we'll have to see. The, I think I might have pressed this, yeah. Now, it's not just about the education, the level of education, but the occupation that makes a big difference. So this, what this graph is showing you, the occupation of the India born, the native born and the foreign born in the US. The blue line is the India born. And what you'll see is there's a very high concentration in computer engineering and science and management business and finance. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's the lowest when it comes to low-skill occupations. Uh, and so, of course, if you're highly educated and you are in STEM, you're much more likely to be in the first two occupations. And those are the two more likely conduits into the C-suite. This is true not just of STEM as we think about engineering. This has been true, actually, of another occupation where Indians have been quite dominant, which is which is doctors. Uh, even as early as the 1970s, uh, one out of eight of every new American uh, physician practicing in the US was from India. Uh, today, when we, one out of five of every immigrant doctors in the US is from India, uh, it's less so in nursing. And of course, uh, a, uh, 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 a fraction of these doctors have set up their whole own sort of healthcare uh, uh, companies, et cetera. The other area where you see is Indians with PhDs. And on the y-axis is the share of all US PhDs in that field. And you see a particularly high share in computers and engineering between eight and 10% of all PhDs in engineering and in computer science are from India. Another factor that has helped uh, Indian migrants is how they enter. Uh, one thing is just to notice in the graph is the contrast between Chinese and Indian immigrants. A significantly larger fraction of immigrants from China come as refugees and asylees. And uh, social mobility in the US is much harder for those who come as refugees and asylees. Whereas you see those Indians is much larger on employment-based preferences. And those who come through that visa status, they enter the labor market already at incomes higher than the median income. Then of course, 
I, I sometimes joke, both the United States and India were colonized by the same power. And so as a result, uh, the uh, among the large Indian groups, the fraction from India that can speak English well is among the highest. And to succeed in labor markets and especially in management, that matters. Now, one of the things as I referred to earlier was about culture, uh, family values, hard work. Uh, I think all immigrants have that, uh, you know, that's why they have left the countries. Uh, all immigrants work hard. I think uh, there is a point that was made earlier that India's diversity uh, makes it easier for people to manage uh, people of very different backgrounds. And the US and India are both share common features of very diverse countries. Uh, countries, uh, but is that alone? Now, what we see is that Indians in the C-suite are much more concentrated in Anglo-Saxon. You don't see them in companies in East Asia. You see them very rarely in companies that are based in continental Europe. And the question is whether the nature of Anglo-Saxon societies makes them more open to talent from outside relative to those uh, based out of Europe or East Asia. Uh, I think one of the things is the democratic culture. Uh, Indians grow up, as Amartya Sen you know, wrote his famous book, The Argumentative Indian. American society is very argumentative, and that's a cultural trait they are used to. Uh, a trait that is somewhat less common, say, of immigrants who come from East Asia. Uh, I think, finally, I think it's important to remember that Indians have been successful much more in tech and finance and not in manufacturing. And the reason is both the United States and India have not done well in manufacturing, right? Uh, if you were a very good Chinese engineer, you came, but you were, of course, uh, uh, you had excellent experience in manufacturing in China, that experience would not, would get you something good in general, general motors, but American manufacturing hasn't been growing, hasn't had the same dynamism as the tech sector has had. So if you enter the tech sector, your, your ability to grow in a sense is much greater because the tech sector is growing much faster. Whereas if you enter into manufacturing, your ability to grow is relatively less because it's growing much more slower. So in one case, it's you have to get to the top, you have to climb the staircase. In the other case, you, you, you sort of stepped onto an escalator and you'll move relatively faster. So ironically, it's India's failures in manufacturing that drove its talent into software first and then into tech. And then when they migrated, that was a very valuable skill because they moved to a country where that sector was also expanding very, very rapidly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Derek, for a very thorough overview of the dynamic of uh, uh, Indians in the sea level in global operations. Um, so if you would hold on, we're going to have questions and answer after the panel. Let me first, if I may, ask a question to Derek. I couldn't reach you on the on the chat. When do you have to leave us, Derek? Because I think you have a hard stop. May I ask you? Yes, absolutely. So uh, forty three of the off the hour. So okay. eight forty three Pacific. Yeah. Okay. I think we actually have time to follow the schedule. You may leave us actually. Uh, you may miss seven minutes of the questions and answers. So I'm going to turn next. And it's a privilege to introduce him. We had a long conversation yesterday to uh, uh, Shankar Suramanian, who, uh, from, who will provide us with a uh, life experience with the issues we are raising today. Uh, he's, the for, he's the founder and president currently and CEO of Amzeta Technology, former president and CEO of American Trends, AMI, 
founder of the Lakshan Foundations, uh, a tax exempt corporation, a holder of a, an electrical engineering degree. So that speaks to us at Georgia Tech, of course, from IIT Madras, followed by a graduate degree from New Brunswick with uh, a, a, a lifetime of experience going through EMR Schlumberger in the United States. As I said, founding American Trends in New Jersey, recipients of patents and multiple recognitions for outstanding contribution to the world of industry. So turn it over to you uh, uh, and uh, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor McIntyre. Uh, for that very flattering introduction. Well deserved, and I only I omitted uh, half of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I find, found the, uh, the the presentations made earlier very interesting, and a lot of the things that um, were discussed. In fact, um, I would say that I had experienced myself. Because my background, you know, I was born, uh, educated in India, coming from India, uh, graduated from IIT Madras in 1971. And at that time, of course, there was always at the back of my mind a desire to become an entrepreneur. But becoming an entrepreneur in India was not an easy thing in the 70s. One, financing was not easy to come by, especially because I belong to the middle class family. We lived uh, paycheck to paycheck. There are hardly any family savings. So to get uh, financing for a startup was virtually impossible. And India in those days, in the India in the 70s, uh, was something that uh, was a bureaucracy for people who wanted to strike out on their own, that it would intimidate the, 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 even the most uh, determined. And therefore, like everybody else, out of... Um, uh, you know, lack of options. I joined the Tata Electric Companies in 1971. And I would say that I stayed in India until about 1985. I ventured outside the country once to get my master's in Canada. And a couple of other times I came to the United States. I had an opportunity to work in the U.S. at uh, EMR Schlumberger. Uh, both times, once in Florida and the other time in Atlanta. And uh, it was at EMR Schlumberger that I got introduced to computers. But both times I returned to India because even though I liked the work in the U.S., I thought that, ironically enough, that the opportunity is available to me uh, as a working engineer were far better in India. So even though I came to the USA and I was able to get a green card, with a green card, I returned to India. And in 1980, I joined a company called MMC. Uh, MMC uh, was uh, beginning to do computer work. They wanted to develop uh, computers in India because in those days, in the 1980s, importing computers in India was not an easy thing. Uh, people had to, India, the Indian government encouraged the design, development, manufacturing, and everything in India itself. They did allow some imports of components and peripherals, but the idea was that India wanted to develop the technology within India itself. Uh, so it was great for an engineer like me to get a job in India because I could indulge in my passion of design and development and thereby get exposed to all aspects of computer technology. So I joined MMC as the development manager, which was really heading the R&D effort 
at the MMC. And I got exposed in the process to hardware development, to software development, to firmware development, utilities, manufacturing, because we had to manufacture the computers in India, all aspects of computer technology. So we developed computer motherboards, we developed peripheral controllers, we developed operating systems, we developed database management systems, compilers, interpreters, you name it, we had it. But as you can understand, we did everything, but it was just scratching the surface. We looked at um, competing products in the United States, got a good understanding of how it has to be done, and we pretty much implemented what was done in the United States in India. But unfortunately, the company I worked for was not able to get the manufacturing license to manufacture the computers that we in R&D were developing. I mean, it's a little bit of a strange thing, but in those days, a computer license was needed to manufacture computers. So even though we developed India's first IBM PC clone, we could not manufacture it, so we had to find some other company to either license the design to or find somebody else to manufacture it for us. Needless to say, the company did not do very well. And around 1984, 1985, the company was doing financially very, very poorly. Uh, the company then decided that instead of designing and developing computers, they would try and see if they could get some service contracts, guess where, from the United States. Since I had a green card, I was chosen to travel to the United States and try and get contracts for the company in India. So I started traveling extensively in 84 and 85 in the US, meeting all kinds of companies all over the country, trying to sell them on the idea of getting them to subcontract some of their engineering work to a company in India. I had a great time, I must say that. I enjoyed my work tremendously. I found that uh, with my background that I had a very easy time of convincing uh, the companies there to contract work to India because we had a great knowledge and uh, we had some products to show that the proved that uh, we could deliver. Uh, but even though we got the contracts and I took the contracts back to India for execution, it became too little too late. So the writing was on the wall and people in the company started looking for jobs elsewhere. It was at the time that uh, somebody in the United States that I had met professionally and who had watched me walk, go all over the country on a shoestring budget, I must say, trying to get contracts for taking back to India to get them executed there. Uh, got so interested and impressed with what I was doing, suggested that instead of wasting my time, as he put it, in India, that I relocate instead to the United States, set up my own company, and then try and offer the same services as a US company. And he said, you will have much better luck in winning customers. <laughs> and that was a dream come true. Because as I said, as an electrical engineer, it had always been my dream to become an entrepreneur. And there it was being handed to me on a platter. I had a green card. So here was somebody who was willing to encourage me. And I thought he would take care of the financing aspects also. It shows you how much little I knew about the financing aspect of running a company. I came to the USA with very little in my pocket at the time because India did not leave allow people to take anything out of the country except for $20, which is about the amount that you could take out. And we, I went and met my partner. Uh, he said that uh, he was willing to open a bank account. He loaned $9,000 to the company. And then it was up to me to figure out uh, how to develop a product, how to sell it, how to market it, how to hire employees, how to get everything done. With $9,000, I decided to start uh, a consulting company and decided to look for customers. So 
I went to a computer show and lo and behold, I ran into Michael Dell and they managed to buttonhole him and talk to him about some other things that I said I could do for him. And Michael became very interested in some of the things that I said. And he hired me right on the spot at the computer show itself. And he said he would give me a contract that would uh, mean developing a state-of-the-art PC for his company, which was based in Austin, Texas. So that was the start for American Megatrends. So I was the company at that time. I relocated to Austin. I managed to find a couple of other engineers from my old company. I encouraged them to also to relocate to the United States. And they joined me and we developed what would have been uh, the first 386-based PC in the world, which we did. We developed it actually for Michael Dell. But after we developed it, Michael Dell got cold feet, decided he could not be the first to be the company to introduce a 386 PC. So he canceled the project. And for those who know about the industry, it was Compaq who came out of the world's first 386 PC a few months later after that. So this was a big disappointment. So I decided to leave Michael Dell and uh, strike out on my own. With the money that I had been able to get for the consulting contract that I had with Michael, I came to Atlanta and continued to do my work. We continued to be a design consulting company. We had a lot of takers for the 386 design we did at that time. By the time 386 had become very popular, and in the 80s and in the early 90s, AMI became very well known for designing the world's fastest motherboards as uh, what we did at the time were called. That the motherboards, as you know, is the heart of the PC. The, the company did very well. The company started to grow by leaps and bounds. In fact, uh, we got rated as the second fastest growing company by Inc in 1991. Uh, from computer motherboards, we started developing software. Then we started developing new products, especially a product called the RAID controller, which was another big hit. Uh, we pretty much signed up almost every computer company there was in the world for that RAID controller, including Dell, including HP, uh, including Acer, you name it. Anybody that you found was using our RAID controller. So in around 2000, the product had become so successful, we spun that division off and sold it to LSI Logic. And the product is still used by LSI Logic, who is part of Broadcom today. And it is still sold under the product name of Mega RAID. So AMI then branched out into new product areas called Mega Rack, which is for managing uh, servers. And that also became a hit. And it is used by most computer companies in the world, uh, like Amazon, Apple, Intel, AMD, uh, you name it. Almost virtually every cloud company, every server company uses it. So in 2019, at the age of at 70, I decided that the company was doing well, that um, my children were not interested in running the company. So I decided that the best thing I can do to let the company to continue to do well was to sell the company. So I, I, I sold the company, but after selling it, I could not sit idle. So I'm into a new startup called Amzita Technologies. In addition, I started a foundation uh, by which I want to give back to the society. So what I would say is that the American dream, as everybody calls it, of being able to succeed through hard work has been alive and I would say it as well. The important thing, of course, is that you need a very good educational background. As Devesh correctly pointed out, my Indian background with a good education, with the Indian culture of hard work and perseverance, but India lacks the opportunities and India lacks the ecosystem to support 
entrepreneurs, at least in the 80s and 90s, things are very different these days. So with the background that I had coming to the United States, I found it was a fertile opportunity, fertile soil for me with my kind of talents and backgrounds to be able to use them and to grow a company. So I would say that it was a great combination. I was at the right place at the right time in terms of the education background, in terms of the PC industry, the technology and everything and coming to the right country at the right time. So success, I would say, uh, with all the qualities that, uh, that I would say that I have to thank my family, I have to thank my parents, I have to thank uh, India, my educational uh, alumni. I would say that succeeding in the United States, which gave me all the opportunities and has the ecosystem to support startups. It was a success, I would say, that I would say I, I did not have to really fight hard for. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very compelling life story. And I have a feeling there is a lot more to come in the years ahead. Uh, so stay with us because uh, you have generated a lot of questions and uh, you've picked up some of the themes and some of the themes not covered by Devesh. So it would be interesting to uh, bring the two of you together on some of the questions. We next, <laughs> excuse me, turn to Derek and Derek Lundston, greetings. Uh, Derek is president and chief culture officer at Live Guides. If my memory serves me right, you grew up in northern New Jersey. Did I get that right? And surrounded by uh, Indian classmates, friends, neighbors, and you have a deep knowledge of India, and you have dedicated your career to use business as a, as a force for good. So you are our third panelist, so shed some light on the core question that the seminar webinar is addressing. The floor uh, is yours. Thank you, uh, John, and thank you to all the guests. It's a pleasure <laughs> to meet all of you and so many doctors. So I just want to say, you know, I'm the least educated one here, uh, and so I'm humbled by that. And I think I'll just comment a few things. Thank you, uh, John, for highlighting the fact that I did grow up in northern New Jersey, um, right between Parsippany and Edison, which I uh, know the area uh, is a highly uh, migrant community from India, from Indian communities. And so I had the privilege to have a number of close friends uh, and neighbors, uh, as well as classmates through the years. Um, and I saw the culture firsthand. So I have a, I'm going to comment a little bit on what Dr. Devesh shared because I thought the statistics were particularly relevant. But also, Mr. Shanker, I thought your experience that you share in your life journey, I was able to witness that in, in action uh, in, so, in a few different instances. And I've been fortunate throughout my, my career in business, both entrepreneurial and working within corporate structures that I've had the blessing to work with and work for uh, different Indian leaders. And I've seen these, these themes in action. And I will say, um, one, the commitment to education that I saw in my classmates and my peers um, back in the early 80s was, was evident. So um, that was something that was particularly important. Uh, the focus around technical acumen, the focus around mathematics was something that was of particular relevance and, and pushing from the parents of my friends and classmates there. And what I also would observe is that many of those individuals, their parents were in fact entrepreneurs uh, because they came here in a very similar story. They have, they were driven and they had an initiative of the desire to succeed, to create something new. And I believe that that is an element that uh, culturally America, the U.S. and India share is that there's that for the people that might believe India particularly have that entrepreneurial spirit. They have a desire to create and they have what I'll call a sense of personal responsibility and self-determination. And what I've seen in the entrepreneurial ecosystem of partners that I've collaborated with, including um, you know partners who I've transacted my businesses with, they all share that. Right. But whether it be in the U.S. or Canada, for that matter, or even in the U.K., I have seen that common trait of entrepreneurship entrepreneurialism, uh, the focus around family and education, the focus on community, and just to the comment around collaboration and relationships, I have seen an astute ability and an emotional intelligence to navigate 
complexity within corporate America. So I've most of my clients from my career have been in Fortune 1000 clients, and I've had the privilege to work with individuals within procurement, within technical leadership, within IT, within corporate leadership. And those traits are the same, that there's a genuine desire to know you as a person. Uh, there's a genuine desire on the part of Indian leadership to help their peers. They want to work together they want to create solutions they want to create a better future and i believe that that is uh evidenced by the the data that you shared dr kapoor um and i think that it's clear as we look at the the contrast of us born versus indian uh migration of of entrepreneurs and business we're seeing that two decades or three decades now generation generationally playing out um the other thing i'll say you know to the question that was in the chat around um, you know, there's a there's a focus on male CEOs and less so on women CEOs. I don't think that's unique to India. I think that's a representation of the broader U.S. culture and business that we are in. And as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm leaving here a little bit in a little bit early because I'm going to be speaking here at a conference in tandem with SHRM, which is may you may realize is the Global HR Association. Um, 350,000 members. Our friend Nina Woodard will be speaking here shortly about her organization work with that organization as well but i think it's important to mention because the the ceo of sherm india is in fact a woman and the i will be speaking with the ceo of sherm johnny c taylor in 20 minutes here in arizona and the focus around india as a talent hub as a talent emerging talent the rising billion and the emergence of technology is a theme that we've talked about intimately and we see commonly right now. And I know for a fact that the investment and recognition of India as an emerging talent creator uh, for the next coming decades is key. And I also know that from a societal standpoint, the focus around technology and the rise of companies and building companies and the, and the desire to bring uh, U.S. experiences back to India to help build there and to do the cross collaboration is of strong interest. And I will, will share, share one last thought, thought about that before I transition a bit into life guides and where I see some, some focus there. Uh, you know, I had the privilege last fall to sit in the CEO Academy event that Sherm hosts. And Rob, uh, Ram Sharam was actually one of the faculty and was the primary moderator of that event. And what I was struck by in that room of about 50 CEOs is that a third of that room had come from India to San Francisco to meet for that group. So there was a large concentration of Indian CEOs that were running international businesses that were coming to the U.S. to learn business practices, to learn both corporate governance and entrepreneurial leadership so they could both bring their business to the U.S. and international markets, but also bring that intelligence and that acumen back to India at the same time, thereby you know, a rising uh, tide lifts all ships. And I believe that was the mentality and philosophy that we see. So coming back around for one moment on life guides, um, because that's another focus where we've invested with the intention to bring the Life Guides platform to India, is there's a recognition around this culture. And what we're talking about is exactly that, is that the basis of Life Guides is that you have lived experiences, you have lived wisdom, you have lived emotions that you've gained through different life, whether it be immigrating to the United States, whether it be starting a business, whether it be raising a family, whether it be caregiving for loved ones. The idea, which is transcendent of cultures, of creed, of religion, of politics, is we all are human beings in that design. And we all experience those aspects of life. And we've built a platform that connects what we call guides, people who have those experiences with what we call members, i.e. employees, their families, and the constituents of our, of our companies and our communities, where they, those experiences, those lessons, that wisdom, and that empathy can be shared. And so that concept, I believe, is one that will, will work very well in India because of the, the idea of peer networking and the idea of sharing information at speed. And we're seeing this now play out in the U.S. market. And I believe as we look at the rise of talent and the idea that we can use that as experiences to create a new talent category, I believe India is ripe to be a market contributor in that way from a talent standpoint. So I know I'm the, the invited guest and the non-Indian panelist here, but I just wanted to acknowledge that I'm very uh, humbled by the opportunity to, to be with you all today and share my voice. And I also look forward to uh, learning from each of you, not just on this call, but in the future. And I'll just add the last thing. Uh, Mr. Shankar, if you live in New Jersey, which you may still, I think we may have even crossed paths at one point because you look so familiar to me. I, I think we may have met even at a wedding or something, um, to, to put it in context. So anyway, uh, thank you. I, I did live in New Jersey. Okay. I, the company was started in New Jersey, actually, okay. in Upper Montclair. Okay. <laughs> so I was there. Montclair as a kid as well. So there. Okay. There. Grove Street. Yes. Very nice. Thank you very much, Derek, for your insightful uh, comments and perspectives. So I have the privilege of asking the first question, and uh, I'll direct it to all three of you. Uh, as India changes, 
as India has changed, certainly compared to the 1970s, as uh, Mr. Shankar described it, has become more open with greater sources of capital. Can we expect that the flow of Indian talent will uh, decrease? And that, uh, and this is a question that Devish has addressed in terms of gains and losses, in terms of brain drain, brain gain. Can we expect that India will be producing fewer of those global talents who migrate and create so much innovation? That, that's the first question. Who wants well, let to me take uh, let me take that question. I'm a little bit familiar with this uh, development there. <clears throat> I can say that certainly with respect to IITs, they are trying and doing a lot to retain talent in India. So what they are doing is to create what they call, um, um, you know, these um, startup, uh, support for startups, all kinds of incubating centers. And if IIT Madras today, my alma mater, is a very different place than what it was when I graduated in 1971. So there is a technology park right next door to IIT Madras where there are about yeah. 300 to 400 startups, wow. mm -hmm. which works very closely with IIT Madras. There's a lot of funding available. So students with ideas, all they have to do is to um, go, go to, the, to this technology park and it should not be difficult for them to get venture funding. So two or three years after graduation, they should be able to, if they have a good idea, be able to strike out on their own. So I think that uh, with this kind of an encouragement, we are going to see more and more of the top talent stay back in India. I still believe with the, with the large population that India has, you'll continue to see migration of people from the US, from India to USA. But I also believe that uh, the kind of talent that you get may change. It may mm. not be the cream of the crop that we were experiencing in the 70s and 80s. So even though you'll continue to get a lot of people, it's my belief that uh, the, the quality may, may change a bit. Thank you. If I may. Devesh, please. I know you, you want to comment on that. Yeah, so I think uh, so Mr. Shankar is largely right, but with one caveat, uh, see the base in India of people going into higher education is sharply expanding. The gross enrollment ratio when Mr. Shankar and I left in higher education was about 2% which is the fraction of youth in the age 18 to 23 who are in college. That today is about 27%. Uh, and is likely to grow by another 10, 15%. Now, while much of this higher education is quite modest quality, what we are seeing is another shift which was highlighted in the question. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Shankar will agree that when he was in IIT, his class had almost no women. Uh, now, what we are seeing last few years, we are seeing a rise in the fraction of like women going to the IITs and in general in technical education, management schools, the top schools. So you have a huge base because after all, that's half your population that was basically you know, at the sidelines of this talent pool, which hopefully is going to become part of it. So as that base increases, it's going to increase quite large. I think that the number of people and, you know, uh, with, who are going to leave is going to continue to increase. But I do think that we're going to see a lot more of what one calls circulation. People who come, who come, from India, they come here, spend some time, they make contacts, start a firm, they look at opportunities, they go back. And, and then when their children are in college, they might come back or go back. 
So I think the, the difference from the past and looking in the future is I, I would see that circulation is likely to increase considerably more rather than the old one-way migration. I, yeah. I agree with that. Thank you. Jag, you want to intervene? Yeah, I think the other thing, uh, Devesh, which is very interesting, is the expansion of IITs and IIMs. Number of campuses have increased dramatically. So the capacity to enroll has increased also, which basically suggests that the shortage of brain drain is not going to be a problem, at least for the next decade, it looks like, and may change even more. I think both will happen. Uh, just to let you know, at IIT Bombay, I was asked to be the advisor to create the entrepreneurship track. So you yeah, may be a mechanical engineer, chemical engineer, but you have a minor in entrepreneurship. In your second year, you decide you want to be an entrepreneur and you, and you do everything. You design the product, get the incubator going, get the venture capital. By the time you're graduating, you are running your own business. From about uh, 20 or 30 students five years ago, today the enrollment is 1,200 students. So I think Shankar's point is very true. More and more Indian enterprises, but definitely Indian government is encouraging more entrepreneurship in India rather than go abroad to be an entrepreneur. But the capacity increase is also a very key phenomenon, not just the mediocre uh, level, you know, uh, through the new universities like the Geo University by Alliance or Jindal University by, you know, OP Jindal family or Azim Premji University, for example. But I think the quality of the well-known institution capacity is dramatically improved. Thank you, Jag. I have a question for De Derek before he leaves us. You mentioned uh, the con concepts of wisdom, empathy, hard work, discipline, and entrepreneurial spirit, and you contrasted it with the natives, quote unquote, to use a very broad concept. Okay, let's say first generation, second generation, third generation. Can we expect among Indian second and third generation a continuation of those sociological features that have made for great success in the C-suite or in the lab or in innovation venues? My sense is that yes, uh, there's still, it's still so early in the evolution of this for, for the generations here <laughs> that I believe we will see this for a couple of generations. That's my personal belief. Um, and yes, I think there's a risk um, similar to what we've seen as generations continue to advance and uh, Indians and, and the U.S. native are more integrated wholly and natively that uh, the sense of uh, entitlement that we see in, in certain populations, um, the the less focus around the family and those values, the less focus around that entrepreneurialism and, and self-determination, I think, is a risk that is uh, pervasive in all mm -hmm. populations not unique to India or natives. But I think that that's something that we collectively, and back to leadership, I think there's an opportunity um, for all of us to, to lead that conversation and to instill that in our children. And I can speak to um, myself personally, that's something that's important for, for my children and my children's children. And I think that we need to uh, enthuse that work ethic and that sense of community, that sense of self-creation and community creation uh, into uh, the integrated populations is what I would say in that respect. So, but as a behavioralist, you distinguish the work ethic in the, the so-called Protestant work ethic, the remnants of which still exist, from yeah. the Indian approach to, to work ethic, right? Can you talk to that? I mean, it's a complicated question I've raised. That is a complicated question. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> And it's one that I would like to go into deeper, but I actually do need to hop it right at this moment. Okay, so, yeah, that's a good answer. <laughs> yes, so uh, I will come back for a part two and I will answer yeah. that question. And I would say thank you for the opportunity again today, but I do need to literally okay. drop it right now. So, You're in Arizona currently, right? Yeah, please okay. connect with me on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me on email. All right. You the opportunity. Thank you. So I'll turn it over to uh, Subramanian and Devish about the, the question of the generations and the question of the unique features of the Indian work ethic. Not to be confused with our friend Schumpeter's Protestant work ethic, or is it the same for that matter? Uh, Devish. Look, uh, I am, uh, I have never been persuaded that somehow 
there is something distinctive in the Indian work ethic. Oh. Uh, all immigrant groups have work strong work ethics. They have to, to survive. Uh, except if you are from Honduras or Central America, it's just that you come at lower levels of education. Uh, so the work you do is more blue collar work, but you still work two jobs to 12 hours a day. I mean, that is a serious work ethic. Uh, so I don't think that the ability or the willingness to work hard or, you know, 12 hours, 80 hour weeks is that is common across immigrants who might start a, a you know, a Chinese restaurant and you, anyone who's run a restaurant knows it's a, you know, it's round the clock, seven day a week sort of thing. So, so, uh, I think the answer is much more the extreme selectivity of migration from India. When you're, put, when you're picking from any statistical distribution from the top two, three percent of any population, you know, it's going to be pretty good. You know, that's the question we ask, you know, how about Harvard? You know, Harvard students, if you're choosing one out of whatever, uh, 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 20 or 30 applicants, you know, that person will be good. It's unclear if Harvard adds much value because these are driven young people to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you get into an IIT, you have to have to work pretty hard in high school to get into an IIT. You have to work pretty hard mm -hmm. in an IIT to do reasonably well in the IIT, right? So then when you come to the US, you already have certain characteristics, mm -hmm. right? So when you compare what we are, when we say an Indian work ethic, if you talk about the median Indian, well, the median Indian is very different. As I showed you, the median Indian is doesn't have much education. Uh, you know, it's unclear if she he works harder or less hard than an average person in sub-Saharan Africa or in, in Brazil or in China, uh, or for that matter here. So. So I, I really don't think so that the work ethic is the driving factor as opposed to the selectivity of the migration. Okay, thank you. Uh, Subramanian, do you want to speak to that? The transfer of those uh, unique skills across generations? I, I do. Uh, and there is, in fact, before you answer, if I may, because time is limited, there is a question from the audience about the leadership qualities that are common among Indian CEOs that make them more successful navigating the complexities of large-scale companies? That's a separate related question. Okay. Um, I mean, I just have a comment to add to what David said. I do agree with the fact that uh, <clears throat> the people who came over to the United States, I would say the cream of the crop. So to that extent, it's not very surprising that the Indian population here in the United States has been very successful. But having said that, one of the observations that I have of the, of the Indian diaspora in the United States is in the overemphasis on education. Yeah. I mean, it may be the cream of the crop who came over, but in general, my observation is that uh, we do seem to attach a greater importance to education. And in general, the family is willing to financially support their offsprings in getting them what I would call a graduate education. You know, in they don't have to get a loan to go to college. So in most instances, the family is willing to finance the total educational expense of their children, which I think makes a huge difference. The work ethic is one thing, but the educational background, I do attach a lot of importance to, which is one of the reasons I think Indians may continue to have an edge for some more time. Okay, thank you, thank you. 
we have just about run out of time, but Jag, you finished a book not too long ago about the transformation of India and some of the characteristics of the leaders which have conducted that transformation process. Do you want to say a few very short words so we do not spill over into the next panel session? The main thing we found is that to build a nation or transform, transform a nation, it takes political continuity, political stability as necessary conditions, but more importantly, a leader who is transformating, sees the world in the future differently. And I'll talk about a couple of things here quickly. A leader who is pragmatic, surprisingly, even though maybe on an ideology platform of some sort. So Lee Kuan Yew, we did the research on that. We did research on uh, Deng Xiaoping, of course. Korean first president was a military leader. Uh, Mustafa Kemal for transforming uh, you know, Turkey just went on. And then we found common traits. There are about four or five that stood out. All of them have significant communication skills. They have the empathy dimension. They know how to reach the masses through an empathetic lens, pretty much. By the way, surprisingly, that goes for Mrs. Thatcher that we researched, that goes for FDR, that goes for Abraham Lincoln, just goes on. But most importantly, they are pragmatic, communicate well, but they are both an architect and a builder. As you know, architects imagine the future and the builders build it. These people are very good hands-on execution and at the same time dreaming or visioning the future about the nation, which sounds very interesting. So those are the kinds of characteristics. The book is quite interesting because we did a lot of historical research of extraordinary or transformative leaders. They looked at three leaders in India, Jawaharlal Nehru as the first prime minister, among 14 prime ministers, three stood out, Indira Gandhi is another one, and Narendra Modi. And we compared and contrasted as to why some succeeded more, the others didn't, partly because of the context in which they were in at the same Thank, time. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jag. Re refresh our memory. What is the title of the book, please? The uh, Rise of the Indian. I, I forget the title myself. <laughs> Well, uh, it's it's a book I've reviewed, so I, I forget the full title, The Rise of the, of the India Transformation. Okay, so we, we have come to the end. I wanted to give you a chance to put in a plug for the book because it is an excellent book that can be used in comparative management a great deal. Uh, Subramanian, thank you so much. Devish, uh, our appreciation for taking the time out of your busy schedule. And Derek also who is now going to another conference. So I'm. Um, thank you. Look forward to staying in touch. Perhaps we can expand and deepen our understanding of the phenomenon we, we looked at today. I'm turning it over to my colleague at Niagni Tree, who is here, and we will be moderating the next panel. <laughs>